I want to, if I can, begin in this month to begin going through just for a few, a few uh, minutes every time we meet a little bit about world evangelism and our responsibility to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Someone said the supreme task of the church is the evangelization of the whole world. One of the jobs and the main job of the church is to get the gospel to everybody. Every church can do that, whether you're 5,000 or 50. They can have a global impact. Every Christian ought to be a local Christian and a global Christian at the same time. I could not be a part of a church, knowing what I know now, that did not have a vibrant missions uh, ministry. I need to know that the church I go to is doing something around the corner and around the world at the same time. Before Jesus went back to heaven in Acts chapter 1, you're familiar with what he said to his disciples. He said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. The next word, I think, is the key word in that verse. Does anyone know what that word is? Both. Simultaneously. In Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said, I want you to be witnesses unto me in your hometown and around the world at the same time. The only way we can do that, we can do it in person, but we can't do everything we need to do in person. We have to do some of that in proxy. We have to send someone. Every Christian has to go and every Christian has to sow so that people around the world can hear the gospel. Years ago, I do believe it was the third most important day of my life. The first day of my life that was most important was the day God took my sin and I took his son. I took Jesus, now I have him. The second most important day of my life, I was 13 and I realized that Jesus had me. And I should surrender myself to serve him. And I surrendered. I think every Christian needs a day of salvation, a day of surrender. But the third greatest day in the life and times of John Wilkerson is the reason I'm married to the wife that I'm married to. It's the reason that I have had so many blessings in my life was the day that I began to commit to weekly give to world evangelism. That's my opinion. I may be wrong. But in my opinion, as I evaluate 50 years of living, I do believe that something significant happened as a 17-year-old boy when I understood that I could do something every week to see that people got saved, that I never met, and that God would give through me more than he would give to me. For many years, I came here to Hiles Anderson College. At that time, Brother Hiles, for the most part, if you ask him about missions, it was getting people saved in the bus ministry, and most of our funds went to the bus ministry, very effectively reaching hundreds and thousands of people and many nationalities around the world through the bus ministry. But I remember sitting there in my seat in the Jack Isles Auditorium as a sophomore, as a freshman in college, when I increased my giving through the missions of First Baptist Church. We did support Rick Martin and Kevin Wynn and some other upcoming missionaries, Brother Long over in Nigeria and others uh, that, that were serving the Lord, including the Johnsons in Brazil and things of that nature. I didn't know them. It wasn't occasionally on a Sunday night at the question and answer time, a missionary would come and show some slides and give a testimony, but didn't know all of them, but I did know that we had missionaries and every week I would give to the Lord through world evangelism in addition to my tithes and offerings. A sophomore year, I sat there, got my new box of envelopes and decided again that I would increase it and increase it. I remember sitting down with Linda with fear and, depth and, and scared. I was nervous with fear. I, I was getting ready to marry her and she had already said yes, but I started thinking about I'd never taken care of more people but me before. And taking care of her and looking at my finances, I thought, there is, this is not good. I am not prepared to do this. If pastor, if dads would have insisted I had $10,000 in the bank, I would still be single. 
I wasn't prepared to do all that, but I had seen God moment by moment, week by week, year by year, take care of what I needed when I needed it. And at that time, I was giving just shy of 20% of my income to the Lord as a 22-year-old young man getting ready to get married. And I was nervous. I remember sitting down with Linda and saying, Linda, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about this next conversation. And I need to talk to you about this, this uh, situation I'm in. And I told her what I just told you. I told her that I had tithe consistently until I was 17 years old, and I just tithed. I rarely ever gave more than my, my tithe to the Lord. When I was 17, I started giving additional amount to my church through offering, and I gave, a, I gave a commitment every week that I committed every year to world evangelism. I said, at this point, I am just, I think, about 20% of my income, I get to give it to the Lord. But I'm a little bit nervous about what I should do forward. And I was scared. I didn't know whether I should back up a little bit so I could prepare for her or what. And I remember her telling me, she said, John, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I don't think I'm really a consistent tither. Because I don't think I've really done that good job with that. Because I don't know if maybe it wasn't emphasized in my church or I just didn't get it, but, but I, I haven't done a good job tithing. And I, I, I feel embarrassed, but you need to know that about me. But whatever you're doing, I want to do it with you. Whatever you're doing, if 20% is what you're doing, then we can do this together. And let's just continue on. The Lord in His mercy and His grace, we finished teaching at City Baptist a year, and we moved to Long Beach, California. First time I ever went to California, I went there in a moving truck. Moved into an apartment, I... I didn't pick out and gave them the money and moved in our stuff into uh, 423 Coronado Avenue, apartment, I think, number three. We went in there and put our stuff in there. And a few weeks into it, they had a missions conference. Tommy Ashcraft was a speaker. Tommy Ashcraft preached. And for the first time since I was 17, someone handed me a faith promise commitment card. Again. I remember why that was, I was now 23 years old, and, and it was six years later, and someone handed me a faith promise card, and I thought, wow, I remember this. And asked me to pray about it and see what God would want me to do and what God would give through me that he would not give to me, to give to world evangelism. And so I prayed about it, but this time I wasn't praying by myself. I was praying with Linda. We decided what we could do every week and what we would do. And for the next uh, 10 years, I was a school teacher. Taught school there for three years and then seven years in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And each of the churches I went to had a missions conference annually. And each time they would give me a faith promise commitment card. And I always anticipated it. I was excited about it. I felt like all but one of those years, I increased our giving. One year, I felt like I overextended myself and our family and I caused some stress on Linda and our home, and I felt like, you know what, I can't go back, but I maybe shouldn't go forward. I sought counsel, and it was agreed that I shouldn't do that. But after the missions conference, about two months later, God let me increase it, and I went over uh, and went ahead, and we did together. We got increased more. But through the years, the Lord has been gracious to us and allowed us to give generously to the Lord. We were giving about uh, 30 3% of our income, 35% almost, uh, when I became a pastor. I got a phone call on, August, on April the 18th, 2000, 18 years ago, and asked me if I would consider being a pastor. I remember looking at that and thinking about that option. I thought, oh, man, I am just, uh, how can I do that? Actually, the salary that I was offered was less than I was making as a school principal. I thought, man, we're going to a problem when the church had $900,000 worth of debt and there were $26,000 behind in our mission support. I came in June. They haven't paid March's missionaries. I remember thinking, what are we going to do? How is the Lord going to help us here? And, and uh, what am I going to do? I remember going and pushing the voicemail on the phone of the church at First Baptist Long Beach. It was the pastor's voicemail. And I got the code and I pushed it and after I saw the little note that said, Pastor, we're $26,000 behind in supporting our 58 missionaries. What would you want me to do? 
question mark, question mark, and it was from Brother Jim Allen, our, our business administrator. I thought, I don't know. I remember pushing the, the voicemail and listening to about seven to ten voicemails. Two of them were missionaries. And they said something like this, um, I'm calling, I'm calling from this country. I'm wondering, did we do something wrong? Why have you not supported us? Is there something that we need to do to help you or provide for you? Are you getting our letters? Um, we do depend upon your support. I hope that we can clarify this. And as I went through that, I thought, oh, my goodness, we got real problems. I remember placing that little piece of paper on the floor. There was a little parquet floor there that the, you could put your, your chair on. It had a folding chair and a little secretary's desk that was in the middle of that big office. I put that piece of paper on that little carpet outside the parquet floor. And I fell on my knees. And I said, dear Lord, you've got to tell me what to do. I'm 32 years old. I just now preached my seventh and eighth message of my life yesterday. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I had no idea we had this many problems. Lord, you've got to teach me what to do. And I remember praying and saying, do you know, do I stop missionary support? Do I just tell them, listen, we have got so many problems in our church. There's no way we can support missions. I'm sorry to the 58 missionaries, but I hope that you can find other support. We can't help you. That was a thought I had. Maybe I could um, just to say to them, look, um, you know, we need a few months to catch up ourselves. And then we can start supporting the work maybe in... September or October when things smoothed out, when we could figure out what to do. Or I thought, you know, maybe we just need to tell folks that, um, you know, that we can, we can catch up. But it's just going to take us a while. And the last thing is what God laid on my heart to do is just to try to catch up. Try to catch up with the $26,000 in the rears and just kind of go. And we had addition to that $900,000 worth of bills on one side of the desk. Just leases and challenges and past due things, lots of problems, and, and had multiple creditors I needed to call and connect with and tell them, look, we're new in the church. We'll pay it back. I know we're way behind. We're working on something to consolidate some of the money to be able to pay you, and then we'll pay ourselves back. And, but, boy, I was just in trouble. The Lord allowed us that uh, particular particular day, the Lord encouraged my heart just to continue to work through it. So every time you get up to go take an offering, forget about the tithe, teach the tithe, teach the offering, but don't emphasize the offering, emphasize missions. Just talk about missions. Talk about the world and the need of the world. That time we had a 1,500 seat auditorium and 100 people came. We're like babies in a matchbox. Just people sat everywhere. There was no place we could rope off. And, and so I was up here in the pulpit, and, and people were sitting in the very back rows. They were just like 10, 10 people in the first 10 rows, and everyone else was sitting out, seated out there. We were just a, 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 de, you know, just a, depleted, a depleted organism, a depleted church. They'd gone 13 months without a pastor. And now they have a new pastor who's 32 and had not even built a hot dog stand, much less pastor a church, you know, and... And now it's, now we're looking at this, and I remember just saying, folks, we're going to we'll make sure whatever you do, give to missions. Take that offering envelope, and let's give. If Wherever we have to commit, we have 58 missionaries, and let's, let's just keep on, there. we've got to hold the ropes for them. And every service, I would start talking, that's where we came up with the spotlight. It's just every service, mentioning a missionary or reading a letter or giving a brief report before there was a screen. We didn't have a screen in our church at the time. We got one later on. And we had all kinds of problems there in the church. We couldn't even pay the staff that we had. And we had problems in all kinds of areas. But I watched the Lord take that mess and make a miracle. I remember little by little, we started catching up. And God began to meet our needs. It was October. October was our missions month. And I thought to myself, let's, let's do this. October 15th, we can try to have, that's our mission Sunday, and we can just have a strong missions offering. We'll try to have, as, if we could get $15,000 on October the 15th, we could catch up on all of our missionaries. And I was excited about that idea, and I kept telling the people, we're going to give a, lot, a large gift to missions on that day. 
so we can get caught up with all our missionaries. But I was terrified because we already needed money in our general fund. And I thought, man, if I start pushing the missions, we're going to have a huge missions offering and a small general fund offering, and then we're going to have to explain to our creditors why we can't pay them on time. Or I won't be able to take care of the, the, the payroll or whatever's going on. I remember that day, we, we went ahead and did it, and that day God gave us, we normally, we needed about $10,000 in the general fund at our church every week to make it. And, um, and then we needed about uh, 1500 every week to get through just one missionary normal giving. On that day, um, I remember waiting for how much might have come in, and the treasurer came out in the hallway, and he said, Pastor, do you know Ann Kay? I said, yeah, I know Ann. Anne's a little Jewish lady that runs around the streets of Long Beach on a wheelchair, and Don always pushes her around everywhere. She kind of has greasy hair, and she's not terribly unkept, but she's not Carrie kept, but yeah, she got saved here a few months ago, and yeah, I know who she is. And I met her down there. I was eating some meatballs down at the little Italian place down on Pine Avenue, and I met her one day, and then she started coming, and started coming with Don, and Don was a seven-day Adventist, and he'd push her around everywhere, and, and, but they would come to our service. He said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. Look at this check. And the check was for $4,760. He goes, she put that in the general fund this morning. And that day in the general fund, we had $15,000. And in our, in our missions, we got $12,000 and change. But that day, I, I, I thought to myself as I finished preaching that night, I thought, wow, we pushed missions and God gave us, not quite what we needed for missionaries, but gave us what we needed for our church. And unbelievable, we hadn't had $15,000 in one week for the whole time I was ever the pastor. And we emphasized world evangelism, and God gave us a great general fund. I don't know all that was going on. I was 33 years old now and trying to pastor this church and dealing with the pressures. But that day, God showed me something. He said, you know what, John? If you'll get a heart for my big world, I'll get a heart for your little world. If you'll keep your focus on world evangelism, I'll, I'll take care of what I need you to do in your church. I started thinking, that's what the Lord, that's the testimony of my whole life. I am one of the most needy people on the planet. I've been needy my whole life. Boy, when I met Linda, I'm telling you what, I, I was as miserable as any young man could be. I was a sophomore in college. I was working 11 at night till 7 in the morning. I'd broken my elbow. Somehow I slipped and fell and I broke my elbow. I was miserable uh, there. I, I started getting gastritis, which is a precursor to an ulcer. I was so worried about my school bill and my bus route and my captain's fees and, and the things of that nature and my grades and then trying to stay awake during my classes after working 11 nights or 7 in the morning and going to school. and I was just miserable. And I needed some kind of impetus to get through. I was going to have to drop out and go home or go to the hospital or die or something. I remember my, one of my friends said, hey, John, let me take you over to this restaurant. He said, you got a bad stomach? I said, yeah, just eat some bananas and oatmeal. And I did, and I went in the bathroom and threw them up both. It's like, man, I think I'm dying. During that time, I walked to this. I walked to the uh, to the dining room hall one day, and and John Francis and and Linda, that brother and sister, walked by, and John said to Linda, "You ought to date that guy." And she said, "Yeah, real real good. Like I'm gonna go up and ask him for a date." <laughs> she said. He said to her the next day. I was in general psychology talking. Uh, Mrs. Evans was teaching that. Miss Jojo Moffat and telling their war stories of what happened that morning when their house coat caught on fire or something like that. And at, at the beginning of the semester, Mrs. Evans signed everybody, signed different men to do the devotion, like a three-minute devotion to start class. And it happened to be the day after I walked 
past Linda and her brother there on that thing, and he said that to her. The next morning, we were in the same class, general psychology, and it was my turn to get up and speak. I gave the devotion, sat down, and Linda said, that guy has a cute accent. She probably said he has a face made for radio, but he has a cute accent. And she began to ask John more about me, and then she went and made a poster and put it over her bed, pray for John. And I was the kind of guy, especially at that time, I, I, I don't think I would have asked anyone to date me because I couldn't take another thing of rejection or another stress. But I found somebody who had some interest in me. And when I found that out, I had enough nerve to ask her. I had her a hot date here on a Wednesday night going to church with her and Brother Howells to do the Bible study. I was so nervous I was going to fall asleep. It was after Christmas, and so I had, I'd worked at the little convenience store over on Burr and, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, I-80 there. It's a, it's a Golo, I think, now, or Solo or something like that. Back then it was a Union 76 that... They had had the aftermarket, after Christmas, they had those little tutu-rolls, not tutu-rolls, um, lifesavers, you know, they're all in the little book, you know, and different kind, butterscotch and cherry. Cherry was my favorite, I like that one. I had like three of those in both sides of my pocket right there. I was going to keep popping those things just to stay awake. I was so afraid, and I'm afraid if I did fall asleep, I'd drool red all over my tie. <laughs> My Linda said, man, this guy's got quite a sweet tooth. He keeps offering me every kind, butterscotch, cherry, lifesaver. Well, I was giving her all kinds of candy that night. But just a few days, I realized that had God had brought me someone that gave me some hope to come home at night and someone I could look forward to seeing, eating lunch at the college or sitting in chapel occasionally, some other impetus that God gave. All through my life, I have seen that God has seen me at needs. I needed comfort when our son passed away. Linda needed that. Our children needed that as we woke them up one after the other and brought them into our room and explained to them that their, son, their brother was with the Lord and how to do that and what to say and would they be able to hang, hang and take the message and know that God's still good and he's still right. We needed comfort and God gave us comfort. We've had so many stories of how God has taken things that we need and met our need, right? We had it financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Because of learning to get a heart for God's big world. Our world, is Wilkerson's world, is pretty small. But when we need something, we found a God that knew how to take care of our need. And we watched that. Brother Jerry Vargo is here tonight, and he went through 11 of, or 12 of those 13 years with us. And we, I remember when he came, and we were just in a mess. But we were giving, and the Lord let us go through that year. I remember the last day of December of 2000. Brother Jim Allen, he wasn't always happy, but he was happy that day. I remember him walking to my office, and he had paper, and he goes, Esther, you'll be glad to know that every one of our missionaries have been caught up. We have taken care of all 58 in 2000, every one of them done it. He was so excited to tell me that. He said, I think we have like $117 left in the, in the missions account, but everybody got taken care of. I said, praise the Lord, isn't that great? The next year we had a new missions, missions emphasis and we added 18 new missionaries at $100 a month. The next year, 21. The next year, 25. Next year, 28. And we just started having a lot of fun. And the people were not rich people. Most of them live in apartment complexes. Downtown, inner city people from Long Beach, California, were just a concrete jungle. And we see people get saved and see people begin to give generously. And the Lord just took a mess and made a miracle. Over the 13 years, we went to 432 missionaries. The $900,000 of debt, it took about nine years or so, but it all got paid off. The buildings got remodeled. We went from one bus and one shuttle to 15 buses and shuttles. We went to seeing God do something, and those little group of people, that were just 100 people there, went to 800, 900 English-speaking people. And then we added 50 Koreans and about 60 Cambodians and about... 
1,100 Spanish-speaking people, and every Sunday, 2,200 people would come to the doors of that church. Like a revolving door. Miracle after miracle, churches started. One thing we tried to always do was get a, get a heart for world evangelism. And of course, you if you've been here at First Baptist Church, it's, it's what we want to continue to do. It doesn't make sense. Some folks, and, and not, not smart enough, matter of fact, with fear and trepidation, said, Pastor, we don't understand. Why do you keep promoting missions? Don't you know we owe, and when I came, I think over $14 million in, in, in our mortgage. Why do you keep pushing missions? It seems like to me we should stop and pay our debt, and then we can support missions more effectively. But the thought is on that situation, I want to get every bit of attention we can get from the Lord to help us. And if we could spend the next 10 years and pay off all our debt and be stagnant in our missions, we would be burning 10 years of time. That people would not hear the gospel and missionaries would not, be, every time they would call and say, can we support you? And they say, no, we're not doing any more supporting right now. We're trying to pay our debt. And I think, too, the blessings of God would, would be stopped in our church. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, he, his idea was he wanted to get the churches that had heard the gospel to begin giving generously for other people to hear the gospel. But also especially to help the hurting saints of Jerusalem. Paul, when he was Saul persecuted the church of Jerusalem. He caused havoc. He caused many of the men to lose their jobs, to be arrested. And the women, he didn't care if it was the mother and the father. He had no, he had no sympathy. He would hail men and women and have them arrested and lose their income, lose their place to live. He was holding the coats for the first martyr, Stephen, to be killed and and now his wife is a widow and his kids are fatherless. And all over Jerusalem and in those churches, people were hurt because of him. And wherever he went to tell the gospel he wanted, he always kept them in the back of his mind. I've got to do something when I can to help propagate the gospel through those hurting people. And every time he would go back and he spent his years of his missionary work winning people to Christ who were in the Gentile world. And now he's aging and his time for being a missionary is coming down. He's in his third missionary journey. And he goes to the churches of Macedonia and Achaia and he says to them, Guys, listen, I want to encourage you to get a heart to give. You're good at doctrine. Matter of fact, he goes on and let's look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And he, he commends them in verse 7. Would you look at verse 7? Therefore, ye abound in everything. You guys are good. You have, you have a, a plethora of attributes in these areas. In faith, man, do you guys believe. And utterance, you're soul winners. And knowledge, you know your Bible. And in diligence, you're hardworking. And in your love to us, oh man, when I go there, I know that you love me. But he says, I want you to see that ye abound in this, what does it say? Grace also. And that grace is the grace to give so that people that you do not know can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that people that live in a different location from these people, they were in Achaia in Corinth. He was going to take the money to Jerusalem and help the hurting saints there that they can give to help that. He said, I hope you'll abound in this grace also. And he uses several things to motivate them. And I, I've, gone, I've told a long story tonight, but let me give you a few thoughts real quickly, and we'll conclude. Let's just walk through a few verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Are you there? Look at verse number 1. Moreover, ye, moreover brethren, ye do wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. Let me just break that down. First of all, he says, he says, whenever, and by the way, let me just give you a little bit of background. Forgive me. He went to them and said, guys, a year before he wrote this, he said to the church of, of, of Corinth. Corinth was a, was a wealthy church. It was an American church today. 
It was people had jobs. It was a port city. Everybody was doing pretty good. He went to them and he said, guys, listen, here's my idea. Next year, I'm going to come through your church one year from today. When I come back, my idea is this, you guys are all saved because I came and brought you the gospel. Why don't we do this? The reason I could bring you the gospel is because a lot of people in Jerusalem, and the Jewish people in particular, are hurting. I hurt them. They're being persecuted. It's not easy for them to live out their faith. But because they did that, you can have it. Let's take some money back to them next year. You can send someone from your church, and I'll have some other people come from other churches, and, and we'll go back. But let's do this. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in store as God has prospered you and bring it to church. And next year when I come, we'll collect it. And you can send someone to bring it with me. And when you come, you can tell your testimony. They can tell about what God's done here. And they can give extra money to the leaders of the church of Jerusalem so that they can be encouraged. Well, when Paul heard that, when they heard that, they got excited. Even though the church at Corinth was a little bit of a carnal church, they got it pumped about it. They got excited. And they said, why don't you do this? Why don't you find out how much you could commit, everyone commit on a weekly basis, and when I come back, how much we'll have to take with us. Why don't you give me your commitment? I don't know how they did that. We do that by giving everybody a faith commerce commitment card. They probably went around and said, all right, how much would you give Moses? And how much would you give Lorena? And Anna, how much would you give? And Sylvia and Shanika, how much would you give? Hey, Ernie, how much would you give? And he took the, the, the amount. Here's what I'll bring in every week. I'll bring you this every week. I'll bring you this every week. And they took that out. And they times it, times 52. And he told, they said, Paul, when you come back next year, our church is committed that we will give this to you to take there. Paul's mind was blown. He couldn't believe it. He was so encouraged. This carnal backbiting, disobedient, allowing some immorality, some confusions of the gifts and all the things. that These people got really excited. And they told him what they're doing. And Paul got so encouraged. He got joyful. And when he left there, he went to every church. He said, you're not going to believe this. Here's my idea. We're going to come back next year. We're going to do this. The church at Corinth said that they were going to give this. What can you guys do? And the churches used the momentum of the church at Corinth. And wherever he went, he told their story. And they said, well, we're gonna, if they're going to do that, we can do that. Now, they're richer than us, but all we can do something. Every one of us. There is much food in the tillage of the poor. If everybody would just plow their own ground and make a commitment and do it, a lot can be done for the glory of God. And they said, here's what we're going to do. Well, now almost a year has gone by. And Paul has got all these churches fired up, and all of them have given commitments to missions, to the project. And he's nervous, and he knows these people, and he's afraid that they're not going to come through on their promise. He's told everybody what they're going to give, and he's a little nervous because he knows how they are because they've gotten real comfortable with their cell phone. They got real comfortable with their cable bill. They got real comfortable with their dog. They bought a dog, and now they've got to go to the vet, and they've got to take care of uh, their dog food, and they've, they've taken on this new car payment, and, and their, or their chariot payment, or whatever's going on there. And he's a little bit nervous that when he comes back, and he's told all these other churches what they're going to give, that they're not going to be ready and they're going to be scrambling, or there's going to be covetousness, or they're going to be saying, what's wrong with this guy? Is he just a greedy guy? He says, so he sends Titus. He said, Titus, you've you got to go do something for me. Take this letter and go and tell them I'm coming next month, and they need to be ready. If not, it's going to be egg on our face. If we don't, if we don't, if we go there, and I'm going to have, I'm going to have six other pastors from other churches represented with me. And if I come and they have not done what they said they're going to do, man, it's not going to be bad for them. It's going to be bad for me. They're going to think I'm lying to them. So go, Titus, and you tell them that make sure they get ready to give to this project. And Titus did. He took the letter and he explained to them and he explains them to this. He explains them this information. 
And in verse 1, he says, when I'm telling you about coming through, he says, I want you to remember, first of all, the Christians of the Macedonia. The Macedonian Christians were poor Christians. They were the farmers. They were the country bumpkins. They were the people that did not live in the inner city. They didn't have all the, the luxuries that we enjoy. They were third world, if you will. But he went and told those Macedonians about all the things that was going on. He said, listen, um, here's what happened with them. And here's what we see. Verse number one, moreover, brethren, as we, as we do you the wit, we make you aware of God's grace that he gave to the churches of Macedonia. He said, when I went and told them all that you're doing, he said, man, these people got excited about grace. And you could almost substitute grace here for giving. They got excited about giving. Look at verse number two. But these, are, here's, he described them. How were these people? How that in a great trial of what? Affliction. He said, these people were suffering. They were being afflicted. They were being persecuted. They were in a bad way. But even though they were in a bad way, they, they had the abundance of their what? Joy. By the way, giving and joy go together. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20, Paul quotes what he heard from Jesus. He said it is more blessed. You know what the word blessed means? Happy, joyful. To give than it is to receive. The happy, I love when our, I think the happiest night in our church is the missionary walk-up offering. After the missionary walk-up offering, you look, joy is all over this place. It's the happiest night of our church. Go figure. Our people give more in one offering than they do any other time for that purpose in one night. And then Sunday after missions conference, we always have a strong missions offering. But people walk around, and I'm happy, you're happy, people are crying, people are slapping each other on the back, we're doing high five, woo! And we just emptied ourselves of all of our money. <laughs> Doesn't even make sense. He said, these people, they were afflicted, but they had great joy. They were impoverished. Look at what verse 2 says. They were in deep poverty, but abounded to the riches of their liberality. They did not have anything, but they gave generously. And the first thing the Apostle Paul tells them, listen, when you're gathering this offering, I want you to know that there are people that have a lot less than you do that are giving a lot more generously than you're giving. There are people that are afflicted terribly. They are persecuted it's not easy for them to get in their car and drive down the church. They're walking for miles. And when they walk, sometimes they're followed by people that spit on them and throw rocks at them, all because they're trying to go to church. And yet, they do it with joy. And he uses the church of Macedonia as an incentive to tell them that. He'll tell them some more things, but I think we'll hold that for another time. But I want to encourage you tonight, maybe this week, would you help me? We're going to spend a few days in this, in this passage of Scripture. Would you read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? Maybe read it every day, just two chapters. Think about the topic and say, Lord, help me to understand what it means to get aggressive about world evangelism. You know, I think most people who have to do this have not been doing this. Most people who have needs, if you check their tithing and giving records, they're not doing that. People that do not have all they need emotionally, spiritually, physically, not always. I'm not one to judge that. I don't know that. But I believe when you get a heart for God's big world, he'll get a heart for your little world. And he'll meet your needs miraculously, and you won't have to say a single thing. You'll be able to experience God's great grace in your life and he can give through you what he'll not give to you. I'd like to see that here in our, my life, in the life of my lovely wife and our children. I'd like to see it in our church. And it's not pie in the sky. It's biblical truth. I think that you can take and you can take to the bank and cash it. Let's pray together. Can we please?